Welcome to the Cowley Foundation's live webcast. We have a special program today on the hunt for distant galaxies and a new program called Space Warps that's asking your help to help find them. My name is Bruce Lieberman and today I'm joined by three astronomers with the Space Warps project. Anupri Tamor is co-principal investigator of Space Warps and a researcher at the Cavalier Institute for the Physics and Mathematics of the Universe at the University of Tokyo. Phil Marshall is from the Cavalier Institute for Particle Astrophysics and Cosmology at Stanford. And Arfon Smith is Director of Citizen Science at the Adler Planetarium in Chicago. We're going to be taking questions from the public today, so please send them via Twitter using the hashtag CavalierAstro. To begin, though, I'd like to start with a brief slideshow and introduction. We live on a planet among thousands believed to exist just in our galactic neighborhood. The Sun is a common star among 200 billion or more in the Milky Way galaxy. And the Milky Way itself is an insignificant member of a vast cosmic web of galaxies. The universe is filled with hundreds of billions of these galaxies strung across space and time. The story of the cosmos really is written in the dynamic evolution of galaxies from the small ones that emerged more than 13 billion years ago to the giant complex ones we see around us today. Here's one called the Whirlpool Galaxy, M51. The more galaxies we can map, the more complete picture we can build of the cosmic story. But finding galaxies can be hugely challenging. The farther away they are, the more dim they become to our telescopes. This image of one such distant galaxy is among the most far away galaxies ever detected. It was announced last November by astronomers using the Hubble Space Telescope. Although it's challenging to see distant galaxies, nature sometimes gives us a boost, kind of natural magnifying glass that makes our telescopes more powerful. We're going to talk today about that magnifying effect as well as why Space Warps needs your help to spot this effect and find faraway galaxies never before seen. Space Warps will help scientists eventually answer some of the biggest questions in astronomy. How galaxies are distributed in the universe, how early small galaxies merged in a collision kind of like this one you see here to become the great galaxies of today, and how a mysterious force called dark energy is causing the cosmos to expand at an ever accelerating rate. Before we go to your questions, however, I'd like to um, ask Arfon to talk just a little bit about how you can find distant galaxies using this effect and why it's so important. Um, Arfon. Okay, thanks, Bruce. Um, yeah, so Space Warps is a project really that's about mapping the universe and allowing um, members of the public uh, to help us survey uh, some, of the, some of the most distant parts of the universe. We there's, a, there's this effect that uh, happens when uh, galaxies line up uh, coincidentally in space that allows this magnification effect to happen. So we get these magnifying glasses in space that can give us uh, something like a 10 times magnification effect of things that are in the distant universe. and allows us to see a, a, a tremendous distance back in time across the universe. And so these objects are, are rare, and we, we'd like to find more of them uh, for some very good reasons. We, we kind of can use these objects to help us work out where the mass is in the universe. So where is, uh, you know, where the, what the mass distribution is? Is it clumpy? Is, you know, where, where do we find the mass associated with galaxies and, and other objects? And so we can use uh, these, these interesting objects, these uh, gravitational lenses, as they're called, to tell us a lot about, about, a lot about how the universe is, is made up. Um, we're asking people to help us with this project because of a really important reason, and that reason is that computers aren't as good as people at finding these objects. And this is a really common thread in what we call citizen science, these science projects where people, where human brains and eyes are an absolutely crucial part of the discovery process. And so Space Warps is just the latest example project for us where we need people to help us in this grand challenge of, of mapping of mapping the universe. Arfon, I'm, sorry. I'm, I'm sorry, Arfon, if you could just run through the website and kind of give us a short, a brief review of how the website works and how people can, you know, jump right in. Absolutely, yeah, I, I was absolutely about to do that. So here we go, so I'm just uh, sharing my screen now. So this is what happens when you go to spacewalks.org. This is the URL that's just uh, underneath our names on the webcast now. 
When you get to the front page of the site, you're uh, just shown a, you know, an introductory screen showing you one of these gravitational lenses here. And it's actually, it's actually this little arc here. The, the task is really simple. You don't have to have an account to, to actually take part, but we'd love it if you did, because that means we can credit you for your, your efforts uh, when we find new gravitational lenses. And the, the task is pretty simple. We go through a brief tutorial. We point out uh, what an example gravitational lens looks like. This is, this is one here. Um, and this is an image taken by a, a survey telescope that we're looking at here. So this is, a, this, is this, uh, a large number of images we have available. So the task is very simple. We look at these images. We look for these telltale signs of gravitational lenses. I know, because uh, I've seen this one before, there's one here. If we see it, we ask people to mark it. And then we click on to the next one. And it's really straightforward, simple interface. You just kind of slide through looking at the images. I can't see anything in this one. I'm going to move on. Uh, and there's a tutorial that explains you know, what you should be looking out for. We've got example gravitational lenses here, things that aren't gravitational lenses. This is one of the really important things to spot the things that aren't gravitational lenses but might confuse people. Um, again, there's, a, there's an example uh, lens here. And if, you, and if you spot something, we tell you. Um, if it's a simulated one, we, we, we tell you that you spotted it. But it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's important for us to be able to measure how good people are at this. So when we have some, we have some simulated lenses in there. But the tutorial is very quick. We have some background information about the science, why this is, why we care about this, and then there's a whole community discussion that happens online. And I think we're going to talk a, a little bit about that uh, in a minute. But that's pretty, pretty much it. You're just uh, going through these images, looking each time for a gravitational lens. If you think you see something, then you just, then you just mark it, and uh, and, and you're away. Terrific, terrific. Um, give my screen uh, back. Before we go to very quickly, before we go to questions, I'd like to ask uh, Anuprita, can you tell me why this effect is so important for your work in particular, your observations? Right. Um, so um, gravitational lensing in general has many uh, applications in, in astrophysics and cosmology. Um, I'm mainly interested in weighing uh, galaxies and groups of galaxies because we can use gravitational lensing to do this. Um, it's a very uh, important tool. Uh, it, it also provides accurate mass measurements, uh, especially of dark matter. And uh, we don't know of any other technique that can work as well. So I'm, I'm mainly interested in using gravitational lensing to weigh galaxies and study um, the uh, distribution of dark matter in the universe. OK. All right. Well, let's go to. Um, uh, questions. Let's jump right in and, and see uh, see how we can address these. A uh, great question on the logistics of the program. Uh, will computers need to download software that will be secure? And uh, Arfan, why don't you tackle that one? So you don't need to download anything to take part. It all just happens in your web browser. So you just if you just go to the URL, it's uh, we don't need we don't need you to do anything other than just have a normal web browser. So Internet Explorer. Firefox, Chrome, Safari, any of the standard web browsers, any recent web browser will work. And uh, all we need you to do is just give us your attention. We, you don't need to install anything special on your computer. It's just you, your eyes, your brain, um, what makes you special as a human. You're a, you're a very good classifying machine yourself, and that's why you need your help. And the point here is really that we have so many images and not enough astronomers to find these uh, effects on, in the images of the sky, right? Right. Yeah. There's. I mean, I think there's. Somebody will correct me. I think there's a four hundred thousand images in the first. Oh, really? Set that we have here, and um, you know, this it's unfortunately not possible to get five hundred grad students to help you go through the images. So we have. Uh, we ask, it's a, but it's a fun task, and we ask members of the public to help us with it. It's. it's Phil, uh, how do I know if I've found the right thing? And uh, uh, does this project, and it, why don't we address that and then go to the next question? Well, uh, when you're on space warps and you, you think you see a lens, if you mark it, you click on the, on the blue arc or one of these features that looks like it's been distorted by a by lens, uh, we'll tell you straight away. If it was a simulation, we'll tell you that it was a simulation either well done as you thought. If, if we don't tell you, that means it wasn't a simulation, and it might be a, a real lens. Now, if you're still not sure, and you're a bit worried, what you can do is you can, you can click the Discuss button, and you can go and ask 
the rest of the people that are on the Space Warp site. And there's quite a lot of expertise in Thor. There are a lot of people who are browsing around and are, are actively discussing what, what's coming up. So you can learn more on Thor. That's great. So we're really crowdsourcing science here. Oh, yeah. Okay, um, how can teachers use this uh, program with their students? And are there materials or anything else that could be provided to make the experience more, uh, say, educational and exciting? So practical advice for how teachers can use this with their students. Yeah, I'm happy to take that. Um, sure. there's, there's, I mean, there's no dedicated teaching resources for this project exactly, but there are a number of um, lesson plans that we make available for lots of our projects um, at, a, at a, a website called ZooTeach, so Z-O-O-T-E-H-E-C-H dot org, um, and that ho has lesson plans for lots of different um, astrophysics uh, topics. Um, I think one of the, one of the uh, you know, the, 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 we know our projects get used in you know, astronomy clubs, in the classroom as kind of breakout tasks, just general kind of fun things to do um, when you're just trying to think about, you know, to cover some, some general astrophysics topics. One of the things that, one of the most novel uses I've seen of um, our projects in, in teaching is actually a lesson about crowdsourcing, a, a statistics lesson. How can you be confident that you're finding a gravitational lens? Well, if you have 10 or 20 people look at that same object, you know, you can, yeah, there's actually a you know, confidence measure that you're building. So they can be, all, all crowdsourcing projects, I think, can be a really nice lesson in in in, uh, in statistics, actually, strangely. I think they're good, they're good match for statistics. We've had, I'd like to back up a little bit. We've had someone ask uh, uh, to explain again in the simplest way possible, and I'd like Phil to tackle this. Um, what is gravitational lensing? I mean, what is this thing that we're seeing? Phil. What you're seeing is light from a distant galaxy. It's usually a blue galaxy, but not always a blue galaxy the light from a distant blue galaxy, that should have gone somewhere else, but instead has been deflected into our telescope. And so you can imagine, I'm, <clears throat> let me hold up my hand so you can see it. Mm -hmm. Suppose this was a massive galaxy between you and the faint blue galaxy. Here's the faint blue galaxy. Behind. Right. Here it is behind the massive galaxy. See that? Mm -hmm. Because there's a massive galaxy in front, what you see is not just the massive galaxy. You see light from the blue galaxy that sets off like this and then gets deflected like this. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the light is, is, is falling around the massive object. It's getting deflected by the massive galaxy. And that's the, the lensing, right? The, grab, the massive galaxy is behaving just like a magnifying glass. It's, it's deflecting the light back towards you, focusing the light towards you. Now, the lenses aren't very, gravitational lenses aren't very good in that the image of the background galaxy you see is very distorted. So you get some magnification, just like you do in a, with a magnifying glass, but you also get some distortion. But fortunately, the distortion makes them relatively straightforward to spot. So when you see a gravitational lens, it's sort of obvious. Because there's this blue arc, or there are multiple copies of the same background source, and it, they look odd. And people are particularly good at spotting odd things. In fact, you could come to Space Warps and, and, all, and just you know, tell people about the odd thing you've seen, and that would be useful. So this is something that Albert Einstein predicted, but of course never actually saw. Is that correct? He was uh, one of them. That's right. He, he was ahead of his time. Um, the first time that, that strong gravitational lensing was seen, that is, when the alignment is so good that, that you can have the light go this way round and also this way round, so that you see two copies, one here, one here, um, that wasn't seen until 1979. Wow. So what's that? That's. Um, 60 years after Einstein's general relativity. Okay. Um, although, sorry, yes, may I add? Please. Although uh, he did get to see the the uh, te the test um, confirm com confirmation of the test of his uh, theory of relativity using the, uh, 
the sun, uh, uh, which caused deflection in the positions of these stars. So this concept, which he had uh, presented, did uh, get uh, tested during his own, own time, but we didn't really see these effects of multiple images and so on uh, while he was alive. Yeah. So Einstein observed the uh, gravitational effects bending the light of stars behind the sun coming so, toward Earth. Right. Someone else did that experiment, and it was confirmed during his lifetime. Okay. Uh, are there any other tricks for looking deep into space besides this gravitational lensing? Uh, Anu, Anu Um Well, uh, usually uh, it's, well, I guess um, the kind of magnification that we get is unmatched, I would say. Um, the, other, the only other option I can think of is uh, building better telescopes. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, I mean the kind of distances that we reach with um, with the magnification of uh, the lensing, uh, which acts as a natural natural telescope, at at those distances we can't really get as much magnification with any other telescopes. So, yeah. Anu, Prita, is it usually one single galaxy in the foreground? Is the gravity from that strong enough, or is it usually a cluster of galaxies that causes this effect? Um, it's it's uh, both galaxies and groups of galaxies that give rise to this effect, and you can see these with our telescopes. Um, in principle, uh, lensing the, the effect of lensing is related to uh, mass of an object. So anything that that has mass can cause light to bend around. The question is how how strong this deflection is, and the galaxies and groups of galaxies are massive enough that they create an effect which we can detect with our telescopes today. So um, that's what we usually use for uh, measuring or weighing the masses of the galaxies. Okay. Um, are there more galaxies when we look in one direction than when we look in another? And if so, why? Um, Phil, why don't you tackle that one? Um, okay. So as far as we know, the number of galaxies is the same whichever direction you look, provided you look far enough away. You can imagine that if you only look at the very, very nearby galaxies, you might expect to see more in one direction than another. And that's true. Our neighboring, our galaxy's neighbors are not uniformly distributed over the sky. But once you get out into the universe at large, as far as we know, they, they, they're as likely to be over, as many over here as there are over there. But they, they do cluster, though. We talk a lot about galaxies clustering together. And the reason they do that is because they, they are actually falling together under gravity. So we see groups of galaxies that are held together by gravity. And we see bigger clusters as well. But uh, we haven't yet spotted an over-density over in one direction relative to another. Arfon, here's a technical question. How do we register? Um, we, you may have addressed that before, but how do you register for the Space Warps program? Yeah, I might just, uh, the easiest thing to do might just be to show you, actually. Um, super simple. Uh, if you're on the main website, then uh, there's a sign-up link up here. And you give a username. Uh, so I can do a username, a password, an email address. Uh, and you just click sign up. The reason we ask for a real name, I think, is important to stay here is that, you know, we care a lot about crediting people for the, their efforts. And so if you give us your name. Okay. Oh, we may have lost Arfon uh, temporarily. Um, can, everyone, can everyone else see him there? Arfon's going to rejoin our group. Um, I'd like to go back to um, Phil, however, uh, and... Uh, Let's go to, uh, I wanted to follow, actually follow up on the question that you just answered. When you look in a different direction in the universe, oh great, Arfon, you're back with us. Why don't we finish your response and then we'll go, um, I'll ask that question of, um, of Phil. I'm not sure where I got to. I think I was oh. saying the reason for your name is because we care a lot about crediting people for their time. So, you know, we've discovered lots of stuff doing crowdsourcing science and we care a lot about putting people's names on papers when we can. So, you know, we, we, you don't need to give us your real name, it's not compulsory, but if you do, then, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, credit you for your efforts. 
galaxy. So that we care a lot about that. So that's that's all that's for. Will they have a newly discovered galaxy named after them? <laughs> now that's the job of the IAU. I'm pretty sure you're not allowed to name galaxies. The um, National Astronom uh, Astronom yeah, Astronomical sorry, yeah. Union. Yeah. I think it's just uh, asteroids still, right? And uh, comets. Okay. I'm sorry, it's bad news. Yeah, you can't name galaxies, sorry. And don't let anybody tell you that you can either. Um, All right. Uh, also, one thing we might add to that is that it's actually quite, um, it's sort of quite difficult to, to attribute discovery in space warps because, as Arvind said at the beginning, we many people will see the same image before that image is, is accurately classified as containing a, a lens or not. And so it's sort of hard to say if there was you know, one person that saw it first and so on. So the way we try and think of it is of, of everybody who comes to Space Warps and signs in as being a member of a, of a scientific collaboration. And it's the collaboration that finds lenses together. Yes, great, great. Um, so our, so uh, Phil, uh, we talked about looking in one direction or the other. Uh, and this follow-up question, is there a center to the universe from one of our viewers? Tackle that one. <laughs> uh, you, you are at the center of the universe, <laughs> along with everyone else in the universe. I mean, so, the, the, it's sort of a joke, but as far as we can tell, the universe looks the same in all directions and would look the same no matter where you were in the universe. So it appears to be infinite in extent and identical in all directions. And so you might as well say that any point in the universe is at the center, including you. very important. Exactly. <laughs> uh, Anuprita, what is the most mysterious thing about a galaxy for, for you? Um, I guess I'll go back again to the dark matter part of it. Uh, it's very mysterious um, because it's uh, unlike um, ordinary matter. Uh, it's something that we can't really probe with any other means. Uh, we can't really use light um, to uh, probe the properties of dark matter. A um, um, lot of um, scientists are trying to understand what the dark matter is made up of. Um, well, uh, what kind of energies it has, um, how does it, whether it clumps or it doesn't clump, or uh, what sort of uh, behavior it shows um, at large scales and at small scales. So it's very mysterious, and I guess a lot of scientists agree with me on that. So how about a quick definition? Um, ordinary matter is stars and galaxies and gas and dust and planets, and dark matter is the other kind of matter in the universe. It makes up about a quarter of everything in the universe, right? Um, that's right. Uh, it, it, it's a significant proportion of the energy density of the universe. It's a significant proportion of the matter content of the universe. Um, it, we know that it has uh, it has matter. I mean, it, it has mass. Uh, but apart from that, it doesn't. Uh, it does not have any other properties that ordinary matter has. So. Um, it, it, it has this effect of gravity, uh, but it, it doesn't uh, behave like ordinary matter in any other sense. So we, so we know uh, dark matter is there. We know it has gravitational effects. That's, that's part of the reason that for space warps. But we have no idea what it's made of. Uh, we don't know exactly what the nature of the dark matter particles are. We are trying to explore that. Uh, there are several experiments going on uh, uh, um, both on like on ground, uh, there are some experiments going on to understand exactly what these particles are made up of, um, and what kind of energies they have. Okay, great. Um, Arfan, uh, what are we discovering about galaxies today that don't make sense to us? And are there galaxies that we find and think, uh, well, that shouldn't exist? Um, I'm not really a galactic astronomer, but I'll take oh, this okay. question. Um, I'm an astrochemist, so I thought about ice on dust when I, during my PhD. I think one of the things that we've discovered from uh, Galaxy Zoo recently, which is one of the kind of sister projects to Space Warps, is are these, um, they're called the Vorverpes. Uh, so these are the, um, Hanny's Vorverp was this uh, weird uh, hot glowing gas cloud that was discovered um, uh, during during the original phase of Galaxy Zoo, and 
It was mm -hmm. just uh, this strange object that was um, that was uh, uh, you know had been heated and was uh, was, uh, was 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 um, sort of glowing a kind of a bluey green color. Uh, it's thought to be associated with a with a, a active galactic nucleus in, in a nearby galaxy. So, um, uh, but this thing isn't shining anymore. So we're just seeing this glowing gas object, but we don't really know when when the uh, when the when the uh, the active galactic nuclei nearby turned off. It's a curious object. It turns out that actually we think we've got a whole collection of these things uh, discovered in Galaxy Zoo. And one of the really weird things I think. Um, that I've just picked up on in science team discussion recently has been that they all have kind of look very similar. They all have the same color, but lots of them seem to have uh, a kind of hole in them, which really sort of suggests that maybe it has been a jet that's illuminated it and uh, punctured a hole in a gas cloud nearby. So, I mean, that's an interpretation that would be quite reasonable, but I don't think, um, I, I don't think they're that particularly curious, but it's pretty cool to see them. And, you know, by definition, they'd be relatively short-lived objects because they cool pretty quickly. So um, yeah, I think that's probably the best answer I can give you. Okay. That interests me. <laughs> okay, great. Um, Phil, what do we understand and not understand about gravity in, in general? Does it have anything to do with dark matter tying together objects? Well, the, <clears throat> the reason we, we think there is so much dark matter in galaxies is because we can see its gravitational effect. In fact, that's the only way we, we know anything about dark matter is by looking at its gravitational effects, uh, uh, how it makes stars move around inside the galaxy, and, and the lensing effects it, it causes. But so far, we haven't seen any sign of dark matter causing gravitational effects that are any different from what Newton predicted. So when we, when we do our, um, uh, with one caveat, I'll come back to that. Mm -hmm. When we do most of our studies of galaxies, we're using Newton's law of gravity. There's, there's not much different going on with, with the dark matter, except that with the lensing, the, the amount by which light is deflected by a gravitational field turns out to be twice what you would get if you just use Newton's law. But otherwise, it, it looks like Newton's gravity. And that, that correction, that factor of two, that's the bit we have Einstein to thank for. Hmm. Now, there are situations in the universe where you need to use general relativity to make sense of the observations of uh, black holes, for example. But for the stuff that we're doing in space, we're understanding galaxies, how they form and evolve. Newtonian gravity works just fine. OK. Anuprita, um, are there, uh, how many dimensions are there to space? Oh, <laughs> um, well... Um, you get a Nobel Prize if you answer that one, huh? Right. Um, well, um, going by the uh, string theory, um, uh, that says that the, the, there are ten dimensions of space and uh, one dimension of time. Um, and the standard model says there are three dimensions of space and one uh, of time. Um, so, I, I, well, the string theory has not been completely tested and um, confirmed, so I guess we'll stick with three plus one. <laughs> okay, the, the, the dimensions we know and love. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, uh, Arfon, does Here's a question. Does um, space warps work like a telescope? Does the galaxy cluster need to be a particular distance from the far galaxy? And how far away can all of this take place that we can still see it? A couple uh, of questions in there. So, well, uh, Yeah, I mean, the telescope uh, that we're currently using, so the images have already been taken. So the, you know, the images are, are static. They were acquired. You know, over the last few years, by a telescope called the I'm going to get this wrong, the Canada Hawaii France Telescope. Yes, oh my. Canada France Hawaii. Hawaii. I got it right. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, so it's from a large survey. So these are, you know, this is the current trend in in astrophysics to um, do big surveys of large fractions of the sky, and that's there's good reasons for doing that. You can, 
you know, do lots of different wavelengths and look at the same parts of the sky, and then you can start to be efficient with how you observe. So, you know, this is just an example of big survey, um, big data, big big research questions that you can answer. Um, so this, you know, spacewalks isn't, you know, your, your view on the universe at any one point is the same as this next person who sees the same image as you, if that makes sense. So nothing changes with time in, in the current operation of the site. Um, we're looking, I, Bill or Annie Brito will correct me if I'm wrong, I think we're looking up to about half the distance across the universe with, 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 some, of these, with some of these. So, you know, we're looking a significant way back in, in, in the history of the universe. Um, but, you know, there, there's, yeah, I mean, the, you know, the, the reason that these objects are rare is that they do have to be aligned in a way that you get this effect. It's not, um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, a happen, you know, it just happens to be that our position in the universe lines up with these two other objects, which allows us to get this effect. But if we were in a different part of the universe, we, we wouldn't get that effect. So, you know, it's, um, yeah. Great. Is that actually? Okay, well, I think that's all the time we have today. I'd like to thank um, Arfan and Phil and Anuprita for joining us. Um, it's been really, really interesting. I hope everyone signs up and joins the Space Warps project and helps discover galaxies. Um, if you'd like to see this webcast again, you can do that by going to the Kavli Foundation website. And if you'd like to follow along and find out when future broadcasts will take place on a whole variety of different subjects, you can do that by following the Kavli Foundation on Twitter. Thanks again to all my guests and uh, for everyone uh, and their great questions. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you again next time.